GCPL presents Amazing Native American Innovators. Our first innovator is Fred Begay. Born approximately on June 2, 1932, Fred Begay was born to parents of both Navajo and Ute descent. They both practiced Navajo medicine and led a nomadic lifestyle across the Southwest. In 1942, at age 10, his parents sent him to a government-run boarding school where he was given the last name of Young and the estimated birth date of July 2nd. The school was a trade school for farming and he graduated with only an elementary ability to read and write. In 1951, at age 19, he joined the U.S. Army Air Corps and in 1952 married Helen Etsidi, who he would eventually have seven children with. At 23, he decided to continue his education and studied intensely to improve his ability to read and write English. While working part-time, he obtained a bachelor's in mathematics from the University of New Mexico in 1961 and a master's in physics two years later. In 1971, he earned a doctorate in physics, becoming the first ever Navajo to earn that degree. It is important to note that he never attended high school. His only education before college was the government-run boarding school, and his English reading and writing skills were almost entirely self-taught. His work career is an impressive list. From 1963 to 1965, he worked at the Air Force Weapons Laboratory in New Mexico. He would then move on to work at NASA, where he would conduct satellite experiments and design atomic particle detection systems for research on the sun. From 1965 to 1971, he conducted research into high-energy neutron physics at the University of New Mexico while he was pursuing his Ph.D. From 1971 to the end of his career, he would be at the Los Alamos National Laboratories conducting laser physics and fusion research in order to harness the power of nuclear fusion, which was considered a cleaner, safer source of power than the fission reactors that were standard at the time. He would also take sabbaticals from his research to teach at Stanford in 1975 and the University of Maryland in 1987 and 1988. Outside of his work, he devoted his time to maintaining the Navajo and Ute culture, languages, and traditions, and encouraged Navajo and Ute students to complete their education. He has advised on education, science, and technology matters to the National Science Foundation, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, and the Navajo government, and also served as the president of the Navajo Science and Engineering Research Council. Fred Begay died on April 30th, 2013. He received the National American Indian Science and Engineering Society's Ellie Parker Award in 1992 and the National Science Foundation Lifetime Achievement Award in 1994. His life as a physicist and educator has been the subject of two films, Nation Within a Nation and a NOVA program titled The Long Walk of Fred Young. Our next innovator is Mary G. Ross. Mary G. Ross was born on August 8, 1908, in Park Hill, Oklahoma. Her great-grandfather, John Ross, was the principal chief of the Cherokee Nation between 1828 and 1866. The Cherokee had the tradition of equal education for both boys and girls. Mary's father was a lawyer, and her aunts were all school teachers. Mary was regularly the only girl in her math classes. Her early interests were math, physics, and science. She graduated high school at the age of 16 and attended Northeastern State Teachers College. She graduated in 1928. She taught mathematics for nine and a half years and served as a girl's advisor at Pueblo and Navajo schools in New Mexico. Ross returned to school, attending Colorado State Teacher College, where she graduated with a master's degree in mathematics in 1938. She also became interested in astronomy around this time. 
In 1942, she was hired as a consulting mathematician at Lockheed Aircraft Corporation in California. Her early work involved engineering problems having to do with transport and fighter aircraft. With Lockheed's support, she continued her education at UCLA, where she took courses in aeronautical and mechanical engineering. She became Lockheed's first woman engineer in 1950. Lockheed selected Ross to be one of the first 40 employees and the only woman in its missile systems division. She, re she researched and evaluated feasibility and performance of ballistic missiles and other defense systems. She also studied ocean pressure and how it affected submarine-launched vehicles. Her later work at Lockheed in 1958 concentrated on satellite orbits and the Agena series of rockets that played a prominent role in the Apollo moon program during the 1960s. She worked on the Polaris and reentry vehicle and engineering systems for manned space flights. Shortly before her retirement in 1973, Ross undertook research on flyby space probes that would study Mars and Venus. After her retirement from Lockheed in 1973, she delivered lectures to high schools and college groups to encourage young women and Native Americans to pursue careers in engineering and science. At age 96, she attended the launch of the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C. Mary G. Ross died on April 28, 2008, at 99 years of age in Los Altos, California. She was a proud owner of the American Indian Science and Engineering Society Achievement Award and was a charter member of the Los Angeles chapter of the Society of Women Engineers. She also appears on the back of the 2019 dollar coin. Our final innovator is Suzanne LaFleche. Suzanne LaFleche was born on June 17, 1865, on the Omaha Plantation in northeastern Nebraska. Her father, John LaFleche, was called Iron Eye and was half white of French descent and served as chief of the Omaha tribe. Both her parents worked closely with Presbyterian missionaries. Missionaries tended to think of the Omaha as exemplary and of what Indian tribes should someday become. John LaFleche's life emphasized the importance of education to prepare his children for the world beyond the reservation. In 1884, Susan enrolled in Hampton Normal and Agricultural Institute in Virginia, a black and Indian education institution, where she studied physiology and graduated in 1886. It was during this time that she decided that she wanted to pursue a career in medicine. She was accepted into the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania in 1886. She received financial help from the Women's National Indians Association as she was the perfect example of a progressive Indian. She graduated at the top of her class in 1889, making her the first American Indian woman to earn a medical degree in the United States, while also spending time talking to church groups and visiting schools for Indian children. The more she trained, the more she started helping the folks at home manage their health when she would visit during the summers between school. After completing a brief internship in Philadelphia, LaFleche returned home to be a physician for Omaha's agency school and also the post of medical missionary for the National Indian Association. She had compassion for the people and helped medically in whatever way she could. In 1889, she was on the go for more than 70 hours a week, traveling miles and miles through bitterly cold weather. She finally had to quit her medical practice in 1892 to take care of her ill mother while also being in bad health herself. In 1894, she married Henry Picot, a CO Indian who had a reputation as a heavy drinker. LaFleche became involved in the temperance movement, which put her at odds with the community, because she wanted to limit her tribe's ability to get alcohol, which they felt, as new citizens, they had to right the have. She did it because of the health dangers, without any political motivations. In 1905, her husband died of an illness that may well have been related to alcoholism. She worked as a missionary after her husband's death, continued to practice medicine, and also took on the campaign to improve public health by pressing for modern hygienic and preventative standards among the Omaha. 
She facilitated the passing of a law that outlawed common cups. She was imitating health programs that were being implemented in big cities, but doing it all herself. Later in life, she grew a more cynical view at how whites were treating her people and saw her tribe as deserving of the same rights as any adult. She became involved in efforts against government restrictions of reservation lands. She would continue to treat more patients than she could handle and became convinced that the Omaha needed a hospital of its own. She got a grant from the Presbyterian Mission Board to establish a hospital of their own. Suzanne LaFleche died on September 18, 1915, at 50 years old from a cancerous bone infection. The Omaha Hospital, renamed for her upon her death, closed in 1946. The building that was once the hospital became a national historic landmark. In the early 1990s, an elementary school in Omaha, Nebraska was named after her. Her courage, along with the physician's compassion, made her a unique and effective leader among her people. Here at GCPL, we have a few resources about these amazing innovators. Classified, The Secret Career of Mary Golda Ross, Cherokee Aerospace Engineer, and Discovering History's Heroes, Susan LaFleche Picote by Diana Bailey. We also have a digital resource to learn more about these amazing innovators. To get there, you simply go to Gwinnett County Public Library's website and go to the Digital Sources tab. You can find that by going to Learn and Explore and Adult Digital Resources. At this page, you scroll down and go to Biography in Context. The site will ask you to log in using your library card number and your PIN number. Once you successfully input that, you'll be taken to this screen where you can look at and research not just Native American innovators, but innovators of all ethnicities. This has been GCPL's Amazing Native American Innovators. Thank you for watching.